So uh, welcome to all of you who are watching at home and for all of you folks here. A um, little piece of, of, of business ahead of time. Next Sunday um, is Passion Sunday. So we'll still have Sunday school. We'll still have breakfast. Or no, we, we put off breakfast to Easter, didn't we? So no breakfast. So we'll have Sunday school here to talk about the, the last mark of discipleship, which is giving, but I won't preach on it until Monday, Thursday. Next Sunday for worship, we're going to walk through Luke's story of uh, the Last Supper through Jesus' crucifixion, uh, and that's, that's the service. Instead of a sermon or anything else, that's, that's what we'll do. What? Unfortunately, that's two weeks off yet. But yeah, Monday, Thursday, and Good Friday services are both at 6.30. Yeah. Yep. So we are, we are in the home stretch. It's hard. You know what, Dami, I can, wa- I can watch the, the, the recording. There you go. And, and these classes are all recorded as well. So, But we will have Sunday school next week. Easter Sunday with breakfast and it being Easter we'll just all hang out down in Schaefer Hall and enjoy ourselves. So um, also next year, no, no, uh, or next Sunday, or Easter Sunday, no uh, sunrise service. So we haven't done that in about three years, and we figure we have more fun at breakfast. So that's coming up. All right. And for you to with my job, And that's good, and that's you know that's one of the reasons I wanted to do the marks of discipleship is is to actually you know kind of revisit these basic things like prayer. Hey, Clara. Can I join? Absolutely, absolutely. Yes, I had one call during the week. I was doing the person was in tears on the phone. Can you please pray for me? I said, "Oh, pray for her." Well, that that does tie in with what we're talking about today, namely the mark of discipleship that is service. Um, And so, let's see, to kind of open things up, well, actually, let's start with prayer. The Lord be with you. Oh, God, uh, this morning we uh, thank you for uh, safety during the night with uh, all the rain and and lightning that uh, a little bit of moisture is all we most folks seem to be dealing with. So we are grateful for that. I thank you for gathering us this day as we continue our Lenten journey. Be with us as we explore ways and how you call us to serve and how we might have the eyes of a servant. So be with us now. Grant us your peace and your joy, for we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. So this morning, I thought it would be fun to just kind of reintroduce ourselves again. And Clara, since you're dropping in, it's just part of the fun for the first time. Mm -hmm. So what I'd like to do is go around and um, share your name again. A favorite TV show or online discovery you made in the past year. So it could be some series that you watch on YouTube, um, something you've been watched, binge watched on on Netflix or something, but something that, that a year ago you didn't know about and now you do and you you enjoy it whether it's a guilty pleasure or something else and then I want then I'll have us consider a time someone served you when you needed to ha- when you needed help I'm, I'm kind of flipping this around because quite often when we talk about service we talk about ways in which we seek out how to serve others I think it's equally important and may say a whole lot more about ourselves about how we respond when we are served. So uh, I'll go ahead and start, Pastor Tom. Uh, favorite TV show or online discovery of the past year? Um, well, we're all, we're all adults in this room. I had heard the name of this show. I knew some of the actors and actresses who were on the show because I remembered watching them as a kid when they were on Second City TV, but just never really paid attention to it. 
And when my niece and her fiance were here visiting us um, three weeks ago, they had us watch an episode of Schitt's Creek. Oh, yeah. I hadn't laughed that hard. There was, some of you have seen it. Yeah. The vineyard episode in season one, I was just crying on the floor while she's trying to do the commercial for the winery. I just, I needed the laugh so badly. So, so yeah, that, that, that would be mine. Uh, we'll save, like I said, we'll save the a time someone served you when you needed help. We'll come back to that one. We'll just do the first two for introductions. So we'll bounce it over here. I see. I had several different TV shows that I do. Like the one that I I watch every week. Um, it's like it's like a learning guide for me. It's called Emergency. I watch that every week, and I, I actually learn through it. And I'm, I'm, I, I think I know what you're talking about. Is that the old 1970s TV show? Yeah. Watched that all the time when I was a kid. So that. Yeah, I, I actually learned that because, uh, because you know, I'm also a certified medical assistant. I, actually, I have learned, I learned a lot through that. So and it's like, I get to tell, like, you cannot do this, you can do that. Squad I, I 51. Like, but it's kind of like, it's like, like um, the show is a learning guide to me. Yeah, all that. Yeah, that that was early 1970s. And then for the second question, real quick, I was looking at that because when I got when I got hit with my breast cancer last year, because you know, because I talked to you as well on the phone, and then the school was also there for me as well. As a matter of fact, they put me. They told me later on for my scholarship I got. They told me that was because of the breast cancer I had. Amazing. Well, this past year we discovered Upload, and it's, uh, has anybody seen it? Okay. No. It's, it's really pretty good. It's if a person dies and they're rich, they can be uploaded. They can have all of their memories and everything uploaded to the, a digital. Oh, wow. I know. And so it, the, the whole premise is kind of intriguing, but then the storyline is based on this one character who learns that he was actually murdered, and he didn't realize he was murdered. Well, I mean, at the time he was dying, he was in the hospital after a car accident, and he didn't really realize that somebody had, you know, messed with his cars. And this is when cars didn't need drivers. You just plug it in. Oh, okay. So, so the whole storyline is kind of intriguing. But, um, you know. Is that on a streaming network, or is it YouTube? Or? It's on uh, it's, um, Amazon Prime. I have to check that out. Upload. Upload. Yeah, and okay. it just started season two. So we were getting ready to watch Picard because we hadn't watched Picard yet. And we were on and we we're like, oh wait, upload is out. <laughs> so we I've heard I've to heard that's good. I have heard of Picard. Picard. I've heard yeah. of it, yeah. Everybody at work says Picard. We we watched an episode last night. We're one episode behind still. So on Picard? Yeah. yeah. Next. Okay. Yes, and it doesn't have anything to do with donuts. Um, I think uh, the name is because of tires and things like that. Oh, okay. Yeah, so it's a. Uh, I had a problem with my car the other day, and uh, apparently the the wire for the for the shifting um, thing came came off. And I was talking about uh, about it with my dad and other things about the the car, and he was explaining to me about the. Uh, the differential on the back, and I, okay. I was so intrigued by it. So I started researching all these things, and I came across this um, this channel, and they explained to you like the the mechanics of the of the engine and, and how how the car works, and and it's so cool. That's <laughs> neat. I've been watching that a lot. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Next. I'm Will, and I think about TV shows. I think about all the. Ah, yeah. I didn't see a lot of the things that most mainstream people saw at the time. And I didn't see, for example, the Cheers episode. Oh, wow, yeah. And, uh, I enjoyed watching some of those. Yeah. Right now. And the, uh, the, the plots are absolutely outrageous. The, the, the characters are rather predictable. But uh, you, you know, after you watch a few of those, you get to know 
get to know the people and you, and you start to relate to them. And then I, I actually saw this I was visiting, I think it's in Boston, with the cheer. Yeah. Where the, where the bar actually exists and it goes down the steps. And, you know, it, it really looks like that. And I enjoyed seeing that also. Time when someone served me. I think uh, since, since my wife passed four years ago, into a few situations, for example, my, my eyesight got to the point where I, I couldn't be out at night, which which uh, was a real pain in the neck because <laughs> I like to go places in the evening and visit other people. So I I uh, went and saw a surgeon about having cataract surgery, which would take care of the of the, of the night issue. Well, it it will, will not admit me to the the hospital unless you had someone with you to drive me there and home. And all of a sudden, for the first time in my life, I couldn't leave my independent self. Ah. And it was just amazing to me how not just one or two, but almost all of my neighbors <laughs> volunteered. I, I had more, more uh, driver volunteers than I had eyes. And it was just a wonderful thing to know. And, uh, and some of the people are people that, I, that volunteered. Really don't know real, don't very well. It's just uh, it was uh, very heartwarming. Yeah. Very very grateful for that. And uh, and of course the, the surgery was successful. Clearly, it's so good. <laughs> and, uh, I can be out after dark. <laughs> <laughs> and we'll bounce it on back. Yep. So we don't have sports in my house, which is a big bummer for them. But I got an email from Disney Plus offering to bundle me for a small upcharge. And now we have access to old sports, new sports, future sports, every sport, lacrosse, cricket in India, you name it, for $7. As far as, you know, some of you have already shared a time someone served you when you needed help, so we can bounce back to those real quick by the time we got here. Yeah, we still got a few minutes. And I love that picture because I love <laughs> Harry Potter. I'm trying to think of his name. Professor Snape. Yeah. So. Because I, I, I was trying to think of it because Harry Potter, I, I literally have, I have all the movies. I got the whole thing. As do I. Yep. So, um, a time when someone served you when you needed help, one that comes to my mind was when our oldest son was born. Um, he turned blue shortly after birth, and they were, and the doctors were very concerned that he had uh, transposed veins and arteries in his heart. So everything so it was running backwards is what they were afraid of. And so they, they quick sent him over from the hospital where Carla gave birth to him, and this is in Columbus, Ohio, to Children's Hospital in Columbus, where I had worked as a chaplain. And when we got there, um, Josh was already in, in being examined. They were trying to figure things out. And he ended up spending a week in ICU he didn't have to have surgery, that wasn't the issue. Um, instead, a blood vessel had closed off early between the uterus and his heart because Carla was on early labor meds. So a chamber of his heart got stiff. So he never had oxygen so low as to call, cause brain damage, but they basically had to keep him in ICU till his heart relaxed. And 
Carla and I both graduated from Capital University, which was across the street from the seminary where I was at when he was born there in Columbus. So we had three nurses in the ICU, who two of whom Carla were classmates of Carla that we knew all four years. Another was a year ahead of us. The chaplains there at the hospital were coming to visit us. Um, and instead of me being the chaplain visiting people, I'm now being visited by, by them. And it was, it was very comforting, very weird at first, because you know, it's supposed to be the other way around. And um, in fact, uh, my one classmate, when, when this all happened, he, he, uh, he threw out a clerical collar just like this and drove straight to the hospital. And as soon as we got there, as soon as he got there, he announced he's Pastor Kenny and he's here to see the Liebergs. And, and what's your relation to the family? I'm their pastor. And Kenny, Kenny is actually about seven years older than I am. He just, he just retired. Who's he was second the career. Son? Who's the oldest? My oldest son is Josh. He's he just turned, he'll turn 32 this year. Wow. And then Jacob um, is 26. Hmm. I, I, why I was thinking that, I was thinking that Jacob was the oldest. Yeah. And, so and Josh, Josh lives up in um, Madison, Wisconsin with his wife. And then Jacob, our younger son, uh, lives here and, uh, you see him here every now and then. He was he helped with the uh, drama this past Wednesday. He was one of the thieves on the cross. So let's let's take a look at at a Numa video I have here that talks about serving. That uh, I'd like us to consider what this looks like as Christians. There we go. Jesus' answer to them, he says to them, let's leave. 
let's go somewhere else. Let's go to the other villages so I can preach there also, because that's why I've come. And then he leaves. There's this whole village that wants him to stay, and he basically says, nope, gotta go. But there's this opportunity to do so much good, help so many people, and he turns it down. Jesus doesn't do everything. And his reason is that he has to keep moving. Now this movement, we see it even more clearly in the book of Luke. In chapter 9, it says that Jesus set out resolutely for Jerusalem. And then in chapter 13, it says that Jesus was teaching as he made his way to Jerusalem. And then in chapter 17, it says that Jesus was headed to Jerusalem. And then in chapter 18, he tells his disciples that they're headed to Jerusalem. And then in chapter 19, it says that Jesus went on ahead, making his way to Jerusalem. You begin to get the sense after a while that Jesus is headed somewhere, and that somewhere is Jerusalem. It's not like he's some sort of you know pre-programmed robot who has no control over his life. I mean, he gets interrupted along the way. Actually, a lot of his teachings are his responses to the questions that people ask him along the way. But he can't be everything to everybody. So it isn't just that he's going to Jerusalem, but it's it's way more than just that he's going to a particular city. It's that he has a compass. That he has an orientation. He has a way uh, to orient his life, a path that he's on. Jesus says no because he's already said yes. He's very clear on what his life is about. Do you have a hard time saying no? Or perhaps there's a better question. What is it that you have said yes to? Because you can't say no until you've said yes to something else. So it isn't really a surprise that when his disciples find him, he's all alone and he's praying. And he's just been surrounded by this crowd that has all these expectations of him. I mean, there's all of these people, and they have very strong opinions about what he should be doing and who he should be doing it for. And so Jesus retreats. He withdraws to check himself, to listen to God, and to make sure that all these voices haven't pulled him off track. You never see Jesus doing anything out of obligation. You never hear him saying, you know, oh, I guess I should because I'm supposed to. That's, that's actually the tension in the gospel, is he's willing to go against the expectations of the crowd in order to be true to the few things he is pursuing. He doesn't let what everybody wants direct his path. And you never see Jesus stressed or worried that he's going to let people down or, or, or worried about what people are going to think. And you never hear Jesus saying, oh, I'm just so busy. The Danish philosopher Soren Kierkegaard said that a saint is the person who can will the one thing. He was talking about the kind of person who knows exactly what their life is about. You, you have a life force. You have these God-given energies. And if they aren't focused and disciplined in really specific sorts of ways, if these energies aren't focused on something, they, we get pulled off track, and they get diffused, and they dissipate, and they get spread too thinly, and they just aren't as strong as they could be. But when you will the one or the few most important things, you're, you're focusing your God-given energies. Do you find yourself saying on a regular basis, I'm just so busy, or, or we have so much going on? Why? Why? I mean, if we were to look at your calendar, all the things you're involved with, where you're going, what you're doing, and we were to ask the question, why? Being busy is a drug that a lot of people are addicted to. I mean, now, obviously, there are seasons in life, you know, somebody close to you has gotten sick, or you're starting a job or a business, or it's something to do with school or your family, but we must examine the rhythms of our life if we're ever going to will the one thing. I heard this guy recently say that he's drowning in good. See, the enemy of the best isn't always the worst. Sometimes the enemy of the best is the good. It's when we become so busy doing all these good things that we have no energy left to will the one thing. 
was with my family and we were at the beach walking along the ocean and uh, my boys were running around ahead of us, behind us, and they were finding all of these shells, only they weren't really like like full shells, they were almost like these fragments and little pieces of shells. And, and I mean, they're still amazing in their complexity and design, but uh, nevertheless, just these like little tiny pieces of like shell shrapnel. And uh, so we're walking along and I look up ahead and I see something floating in the water and I think, is that, is that it? It is. And we all look out and there, floating offshore about 30 feet, is a huge starfish that's just kind of bobbing there peacefully in the water. And so as a family, we stop and we're just watching it. And one of my boys gets this look in his eyes like, that starfish is mine. And so he charges <laughs> into the water. And he gets partway in and he turns and he runs back up onto the beach. And we're all like, that's your starfish, go get it, go get it. And he turns around, he runs back into the water, and he gets even farther out this time. And then he stops and he charges back up onto the beach. And he's getting more and more agitated and anxious. And we're like, what's the problem? Go get it, it's right there, you can get it. So he charges back and he goes even farther into the water this time. And at the last minute, turns around and runs back up on the beach, and he's getting more and more frustrated, more and more anxious, and we're all saying to him, what's the problem? Just get it. Why can't you get it? He says, I can't do it. And we say, why? And he says, because my hands are filled with shells. Is this you? So busy doing so much that your hands are filled with shells? And some of it, all of it, may even be good, but you can't grab hold of the starfish. May you drop your shells in the pursuit of a simple, disciplined, focused life in which you pursue the few things God has for you. And may you be like Jesus, able to say no, because you've already said yes. An interesting aside is this was the 20th NUMA video that he did, and there were a total of 24. His son appears in several of them, including uh, the very first NUMA video where that boy is just probably 10 months old. Um, so it's kind of fun watching his, his son grow up over well, over a span of seven, eight years, because the first one was done in 2001, that was done 2008. Um, but love this video with you know, the, the question about the, the whole starfish and too many shells. jar and the rocks, the big rocks, the medium rocks, and the little rocks. Okay, why don't you tell, tell us that, because I'm not sure which one you're going with. Well, the big rocks, and so the important things in life are faith, family, and work. I mean, it, that this is one analogy. And that if you put, and the big rocks are faith, the medium are family, and the little rocks are pebbles. Our work. So if you pour the pebbles in the jar first, and then then you put either of the big or medium in next, there's no room for the remainder. But if you put the big rocks in first, faith, the next rocks, family, no problem, and then the little rocks, work, which is still important, you pour it in and it filters through so you can put it all in your jar. So it, that's more of a priority kind of thing, but it's similar to the shells. Yeah, yeah. The uh, gospel reading for today comes out of um, John's gospel. We, even though we're in the year of Luke, as we get close to Holy Week, we get little bits and pieces of John. And in this one, Jesus is visiting the home of, of his friend Lazarus when a woman comes and washes his feet with expensive perfume uh, and, and uh, uses her tears 
and then dries his feet with her hair. And everyone's really confused about the passage. In fact, let me go ahead and read it. Because it, it, one of the things I'm going to mention in my sermon is if you consider all these you know, little buttons that we've got with all the different marks that we've been studying, you consider praying always, worshiping weekly, um, what else we got here? Reading the Bible. Friendship. Friendship. All those things build the foundation of faith that ultimately drives us to do what I would argue with in light of the video. The one thing that is most important that makes us church is service. The others can all turn in very quickly into navel gazing where we just get focused in on ourselves and become those shells that we hang on to and then we never figure you out. You know what, with the foot washing, I was washing the uh, Stimmer Phil this morning. I was like wondering about that. It was for, um, the, I think in, in Tokyo or Japan, um, because somebody, because what happened is guy, next to the motorcycle, he was washing his feet and they were asking why because he was getting in per preparation before he went to the church across the street and this was in, in Japan. Yep, yep. Let me go ahead and read the passage here. Uh, six days before the Passover, Jesus came to Bethany, the home of Lazarus, whom he had raised from the dead. There they gave a dinner for him. Martha served, and Lazarus was one of those at the table with him. Mary took a pound of costly perfume made of pure nard, anointed Jesus' feet, and wiped them with her hair. The house was filled with the fragrance of the perfume. But Judas Iscariot, one of his disciples, the one who was about to betray him, said, why was this perfume not sold for 300 denarii and the money given to the poor? He said this not because he, was, because he cared about the poor, but because he was a thief. He kept the common purse and used to steal what was put into it. Jesus said, leave her alone. She bought it so that she might keep it for the day of my burial. You, always have the, you will always have the poor with you, but you do not always have me. In the, we have two foot washing stories that appear in John. The first one is, is Mary uh, right now washing Jesus' feet. Then the next one is what we'll hear Monday, Thursday, when Jesus washed the feet of the disciples. Um, both are intended to be gifts. And in both cases, the disciples got confused as far as what was, what was going on for those who were observing uh, you know, what, what does this mean uh, to take the time to serve? Um, it really is a hallmark of what the church and what being a disciple is. Um, but trying to fit it into your life becomes difficult. Um, service, we kind of, I think at times, equate as something extra from what we, we normally do. Um, I'll move this ahead a bit here. There's a different side of discussion questions. The one thing that I think is important about serving is that serving ultimately, I think, always comes down to being with someone else face to face. Service is done in person. You can give gifts to make service happen, and those are always welcome. I think of, of you know, Lutheran World Relief, uh, charities like Food for the Poor. They can't do what they do without the gifts, but our gifts are really out of that act, are, are giving, it's generosity. It's not necessarily service. Service is taking the time to focus on what is most important. Um, in light of where, where Rob was going with this, how difficult do you find it to manage your calendar and manage your faith.
I know, it's a really tricky question. It should. I haven't fully succeeded at that. <laughs> you know, I, you know, I may be a pastor, but every week I end up spending time doing stuff where I'm a landlord for schools that rent space here. And the other staff help, and, but you know, that's something that's... Ministry can happen in our relationship with the schools, but when you're working on writing up a lease, that's not ministry. And I didn't take that class when I was in seminary. Um, and then I look at my calendar and it's just, you know, I'll look at the end of the day and I had my to-do list over here and then I've written down what I actually did and I'm lucky if two actually correspond because it's Lent. At least that's, that's my excuse. And so you, you end up doing the routines of, of, of busyness, which I kind of, I, I, enjoy, I enjoy that video watching Rob walk through the streets of Grand Rapids, Michigan. That's where that was filmed. And just, you know, when you read Mark's gospel, Jesus is always heading for Jerusalem. Jesus always has his focus. And so often when it comes to my life, I end up doing what some people call goat walking. And this is a phrase for people who raise goats and sheep. Um, goats don't walk in a straight line when you turn them loose in a field. They just kind of go all here and there and everywhere. And it's just you know, where the food is and their heads are down and they don't really see what's going on. Sheep are really good at that. And sheep will actually go right off the edge of a cliff if they aren't paying attention. But goat walking is never in a straight line. Jesus, Jesus has his focus. Um, you know, it seems faith and you know, we should be focused on service. And, and yet somehow, is, as, as a congregation, as individuals, that leap from taking what you know, these things are and converting it into serving others doesn't always happen the way we would like. You know, earlier Valerie made a comment. And by the way, I want to comment that the uh, TV show Upload, it's adult, so don't watch it with your <laughs> <laughs> um, Good to know. Valerie made a comment earlier about, you know, she gets phone calls in her job, and people ask her to pray for them. And it occurs to me quite often that this concept of serving, and Will, you said it last week when you talked about your grandfather, I think, mm -hmm. that Monday to Friday is so important and you know and, and I always I feel that that's a, an important place for us to focus and that the things that we can do to respond to people and detect that they need something mm -hmm. or even if they ask directly that they need something that you know that that's a way for us to demonstrate serving or act on serving uh, just you know it's not just what we set out to say, okay, we'll be involved in this thing, but to be, um, you know, just available and ready to respond that way Monday to Friday. Um. The last bullet point there, I think, is, is a significant one. And I'm, this is probably going to come out in, in, in my sermon for Monday, Thursday. But this image of the foot washing as, as serving. Um, that, that statement there, how important is is serving in a way that asserts the dignity of those served. 
Um, there's the type of service that's kind of like with a child where you know you as the adult are giving them something or you are helping them in some way and as an adult to child I mean you always have you know the height issue going on um, and Jesus talks about a similar type of situation of, of those who in their giving in Roman culture um, are people of higher status who are giving and serving to others, but they get recognition out of it. They receive the, ti the title of benefactor or patron. Um, Try this with a child sometime. Now, my, my kids are all tall like yours now, but do this with a little kid if you ever have the chance, or think back on, on, on your own kids of the difference between giving a gift like this and getting down here and giving a gift. You know, I think about some of the things that I got my boys because when I'm giving like this, it's, oh, you know, go off and play with it. When I got down like that, we're going to put something together, and we're going to have fun. Um, that's why when, when kids come forward for communion, um, my knees are still good enough, where I will try and get down and get on eye level as much as possible um, out of that very thing that to, to treat to someone with dignity as, as you serve requires that eye-to-eye -eye contact on that same level and communicating that in body language with kids I think is hugely important. Um, I'm not sure what more to say about it, but have you ever had a similar experience, perhaps? <laughs> I have. Um, in our one congregation in California, we, um, our home, my home church, was lucky enough to have um, an older church on the property that now serves as the chapel. Ah. Coming um, every time the every time our church hosted these families, I would come in once or twice during their stay, and uh, and the kids and we would cook and then commune with the um, with the families that were staying there. And we were highly encouraged. I mean, yes, bring your kids. Let your kids play with you know the kids on the playground and feast. I mean, one of the not requirements, but request was that cook and then you sit down with your children and the families and you eat with them uh, and let them help clean up and make it um, more social and make it more relatable rather than like you say of taking pictures of the person handing it down and saying here go eat and I'll still be back here cleaning up. That's not the experience that the organization wanted it families. Yeah. They wanted it more normalized, um, more social, more family oriented, and more communal. So I do have that experience. I mean, it was still always awkward. And, I mean, I always felt overprivileged and guilty and, you know, the, the difference in the way everybody was dressed and the difference in the way everybody spoke. And, uh, but it was my problem. I mean, mm -hmm. the families were grateful and real and appreciative and still kind of felt like the adult and the kid going on, but when you got in there and you started, yep. you know, socializing and talking to everybody and especially seeing the kids play together, 
it didn't feel like that as much. Yeah. One of the things that I invite people to do when they first come to a church where I'm pastor at, and St. John being one of them, is come serve with us first before you join. You know, see, see what we actually do before you jump in with both feet. Because um, I, I think that it says a lot about our congreg you know, about our congregation when you see how people serve, how, see how people welcome, see how we screw up. Um, and, and, we, and we still manage to get along and still serve side by side. Yes, like any church, we never have enough people to usher and greet and those type of things. And yet when it actually happens, people show up at the altar rail. You know, I don't know who the communion assistants are today, but someone's going to be there. Um, there, there's that sense of serving that has a, a, a joyful humility about it. Um, I was just talking with someone this week that you know, we are among the Lutheran congregations, ELCA congregations here in Orlando. We are intentionally the most formal when it comes to worship. And we, we do the robes, we have communion every week, you know, we have the great organ in that. Um, but he echoed what I say. We, we may do traditional worship, but we laugh a lot. Um, and and I, I think that's something that says about, about service. As service is, service is serious, but service is joyful. Service takes us in places that make us uncomfortable, and service opens up things about ourselves and others that we never experienced before. Even something as, as simple as being a communion assistant for someone for the first time looking the other way, and you're now saying blood of Christ shed for you instead of the one always receiving it. Um, I, so we're going to be doing training again. We just fin we're just finishing up with the confirmation class right now for communion assistant and worship assistant. Uh, but reading lessons and things like that, it's, it's different than community outreach type service, but yet it still is offering your gifts to God in the context of the community, which is part of that one thing, I think. 